This is a segment from The Annex, an academic sociology-themed podcast. For more, visit us on the web at theannexpodcast.com. And now we turn to Mark Horowitz from Seton Hall. Mark wrote Sociology, Sacred Victims, and the Politics of Knowledge, Moral Foundations Theory, and Disciplinary Controversies in the American Sociologist. It's an interesting piece that turns the lens back on our discipline. My first reaction to your piece, Mark, was, uh, oh, wow, this could get us arguing for hours. (laughs) (laughs) And then, you know what? I was doing show prep this morning, and I thought to myself, wow, this can be a topic that people react badly to in a way, right? It makes a lot of points that I think could be taken negatively. And this is why we're talking about our own community's taboos. And when you discuss a taboo as a cultural cultural artifact, as opposed to an objective truth, you make violating that taboo more logically viable, right? Mm -hmm. And Mark's paper touches on a lot of discussions about us that are going on in the broader public sphere and their discussions that we, I don't think we're having internally. Uh, and uh, I, I spoke to Mark and Mark is just uh, really great at gingerly navigating these issues. And so I'm really grateful to have you uh, come on to uh, talk to us about some, on some level, some very brave research that you're putting out, Mark. I have to tip my hat to you. Well, I appreciate that. I'm, I'm certainly delighted to be on to discuss it. Um, do you mind if I say just a few words about the broader project before homing in on totally. this pace? Please. Please. Just very briefly, because um, it's been about four or five years that my colleagues and I have been uh, examining controversies within the social sciences. Mm-hmm. So at this point, we've done major surveys, a couple of them of anthropologists. This is the second we've done of sociologists, mm-hmm. one of economists, and we're working on right now one of developmental psychologists. Mm-hmm. So what we do is we examine these controversies uh, from the standpoint of a school of social psychology or political psychology mm-hmm. um, called moral foundations theory. It's associated with Jonathan Haidt. You're familiar with him? I'm not sure. I, I, can you just spell it out for us? Yeah, sure. Moral foundations theory. Yeah, moral foundations theory. It's actually, it's very complicated and barks a lot of threads, but uh, the basic idea is that undergirding our political beliefs mm-hmm. are certain moral intuitions or emotions that have a deep evolutionary history. Mm -hmm. So moral foundations theory has a kind of innatist element to it, but it's certainly not deterministic. It talks about pre-wiring and first drafts of our sort of emotion complexes that end up in tandem with our socialization to crystallize into certain political identities and sensibilities. So what I do is I use moral foundation theory to discuss controversies within social science fields Mm -hmm. and see how those controversies often are largely predicted, if you would, by scholars' political orientation. So if you go to a controversy in economics, you go to a controversy in sociology, Mm -hmm. whatever the social science field is, and you know what the social scientist political orientation is, Mm -hmm. you can make a really decent guess about where they're going to stand on a particular empirical matter in their field, especially these sensitive empirical questions like the ones in sacred victims, right? So, uh, So I map that demonstrate it across social science. I say I, my colleagues and I, we map it, we demonstrate it across these social science fields, and then we tentatively explain it using this kind of framework that, again, brings in evolutionary theory. I know that's unusual for sociologists Mm -hmm. to entertain a kind of evolved biology in what we do, but uh, I find it uh, quite plausible. I'd love, I I want to get to it for a bit, but I'd like to start by setting us up with sociology sacred victims. Can you tell us about the paper? Absolutely, yeah. So we sent out a survey um, to, I think the final end might have been 479. Uh, we used the U.S. News and World Report, uh, national universities, liberal arts colleges, and literally went to every single sociologist we could find in all of those schools. Mm. And I um, can't remember the exact response rate, uh, but it, we ended up with a end of about 450, 470. Mm-hmm. And we asked sociologists a number of questions um, about controversies that are quite divisive in their fields. Mm-hmm. And we explore the extent to which political orientation and other variables. It turns out gender is also significant. Uh, The paradigm that you use in sociology is also significantly associated with where you stand. I can go into detail about that if you're interested. But we we didn't shirk from going to some really sensitive uh, (laughs) issues. So we we looked at whether kind of revisiting the old culture of poverty question, Mm -hmm. whether culture can cultural practices within the inner city 
can play a, at least some independent role in tandem with these more decisive structural factors in perpetuating poverty, specifically in the black community. Uh, we looked at gendered occupational choice and whether there could be in tandem with socialization and sexism, could there also be a kind of average biological difference between men and women that plays some role in the, the, the unequal distribution across work roles in the economy. And then uh, we- The added, Larry Summers uh, yeah, argument. We, we, revisit, we directly revisited the Larry Summers issue. And then finally, uh, immigration. And then the question of whether immigration flows can impact uh, uh, what and this, this is language usually used by conservatives, but like the cultural cohesion or the social cohesion of society, whether there can be drawbacks and whether we should have policy and immigration informed mm -hmm. by data on whether immigration can be harmful. So those three very sensitive issues and on question after question, uh, we found that a sociologist politics largely predict their opinion on it. So you say that there's ideological blind spots, that we have sort of worldview commitments that structure our thoughts and our empirical analyses, too. So it's like a type of groupthink, right, where we fail, where we often fail to recognize that we fail to recognize the structuring our views. So what what is the sociologist uh, worldview? Where are these taboos? I guess you kind of went over that, right, in your thing. Well, it's, it's, it's to the extent that people on the liberal left end mm -hmm. of the political spectrum have underlying moral sensitivities. I mean, the cliche mm -hmm. of like the leading heart liberal, I actually think is just actually factually true. Mm -hmm. There's some truth to it that, that people on the left of this political spectrum literally emote more, like suffer more for the vulnerable. Mm -hmm. I'm not, I'm not waving a flag, like celebrating us and saying that I'm simply pointing it. Out. I think it's empirically true. Worry about the polar bear more mm -hmm. kind of thing, you know, with climate change and that sort of sensibility we construct and when we interact with people that have like-minded sensibilities we tend to sort of inadvertently or consciously police people with those same sensibilities so certain kinds of questions we find very inviting so people on the very far left of the field which makes up a large percentage of people in the field there's mm -hmm. virtually no conservatives or libertarians in sociology mm -hmm. um, those people on the far left will find inviting critical analyses of power you know why so why all the attention and intersectionality and how these both conscious bigotry and more impersonal processes disadvantage vulnerable groups. Well, because it resonates with us right. and we care deeply about these groups. And we also have a strong anti-authoritarian impulse, a kind of distrust toward a bully or toward a leader. Mm -hmm. So those sorts of moral sensitivities, I think, inform the kinds of questions we ask and oftentimes render taboo certain kinds of claims that I think have at least some degree of plausibility. Okay. So I, so one of, so I, in reading the, in, in reading this article, um, one of the things uh, that I was interested in is you, the whole like wine guard and wine guards, you know, argument that much of sociology adheres to uh, this concept of sacred cosmic egalitarianism, mm -hmm. right? right. Uh, which I guess is the belief that all ethnic and cultural and social and, you know, whatever gender groups um, are all, you know, pretty much inherently equal, right? Um, like along a, a line of, uh, of socially desirable traits, right? And so, and the thing is, right? So I get that, right? I don't think all of sociology adheres to this, right? But I mean, but I think a lot of sociology does, you know, it says, basically says, we're, I, we're going to take as a given that everyone is equal, right? Along, you know, along these traits, right? unless, you know, empirical evidence shows me otherwise. One of the things I find interesting is that there are other disciplines, right, that take the opposite as a given, right? They take a, as a given that, you know what, these different groups are inherently unequal in terms of the distribution of these desirable traits. And we take that as a given unless you prove otherwise empirically, right? So how much, I, I'm wondering how much of sort of this difference uh, is about a lack of objectivity versus a difference in the basic assumptions, right, that different disciplines make um, about groups and group differences, right? And what each discipline constitutes as proof. I think that um, it's interesting you said, Leslie, that disciplines feel that these groups are like essentially mm -hmm. unequal or something like that. I mean, there's the empirical reality, obviously. If mm -hmm. we look at the racial ethnic hierarchy, for example, we're going to find black and brown people with less 
on average access to socially valued goods. Mm-hmm. I mean, the real rub is how we explain that. And I think uh, people in sociology, particularly those with liberal left sensibilities, are going to find very congenial arguments that speak to unjust power, that speak to, you know, we're all essentially the same in our traits, so it must be some external force. Mm-hmm. You know, so to go to the example of uh, gendered occupational choice, I cite, uh, I don't know if you remember from the article, but I cite one of the respondents who says, well, I have to just out myself right here. Mm-hmm. You know, I, I, I find that biology does matter. I, don't, I, I think social factors matter more. And it, it kind of this very apologetic spirit. Mm-hmm. But I mean, at the end of the day, if it's the case that there could be an average biological difference between men and women that plays a role in the distribution of work roles, then then we need to sort of address that and not have our political and moral sensitivities render it off limits. And her sort of defensiveness and a lot of it was interesting when I was because we provided comment boxes after all of our questions. We have this just massively rich data source that I certainly could could plumb for future studies if I wished. Mm. But just a lot of self censorship, a lot of expressions of people saying I, I I think certain things I just don't feel I can say it. Mm-hmm. Um, so that's sort of what we're getting at. I think. The, on both sides. I don't know about academic fields that look at it the other way, but we, certainly the political right does. The political right dismisses s- social structure. You know, far right thinks it's all just culture of poverty, for example, on the, mm-hmm. on the question of inner city poverty. So I think that they're empirically wrong, due in large part because of their moral sens- sensibilities and differences. Not, not solely, but that's part of the story. So but it's I'm, a complicated... Sorry if I'm going in different directions, but go ahead. No, no. I'm sorry, John. Uh, no, okay. no, please. Uh, so uh, I'm getting the gist of of you uh, of your argument to involve some type of process where we self select into these disciplines based on either biological or at least prior sort of affinities towards egalitarian arguments or towards empathy or towards you know nurturant behavior or something like that. Is that the main thrust of sort of the worldview that led you into this? Absolutely. I think you, you hit the nail on the head there. And I would also play, we self-select, but there's also people who are, you know, who are grooming us as mm-hmm. faculty. Then we go on to the academic market. And it's not only about the empirical work that we do. Mm-hmm. It's, a certain, it's a certain moral orientation to the world mm-hmm. that gets rewarded, that if you're on the liberal left and you demonstrate sufficient commitment to those things, you're going to be attractive to people who share those same sensibilities. It's not a grand conspiracy. It's just the flow of how the institution works. People gravitate toward people that are like them. Well, so I agree with you. Yeah, I think it's so I, but here it's, it's really interesting that you say that it's kind of like living in Bethesda, which is where I live, where Bethesda is supposed to be this, like, I don't know, this like hotbed of like liberal thought. Right. Mm -hmm. Um, And so no matter what conversation you have with someone, right, someone will, you know, almost inevitably, I mean, it's it's right outside of D.C., the conversation will turn to politics Mm -hmm. and someone will start to demonstrate just how liberal they are. Right. Mm -hmm. And you can tell the people who actually are coming at it from like, yeah, well, this is just part of my moral upbringing and this happened organically. And the people who have been socialized, right, within Bethesda to actually have certain talking points, right? Um, And I think that we see that in the discipline as well. I think we see people, as you say, who self-select into it because they believe that um, in many ways, the discipline like is you know, the more like the moral stance, right, mm-hmm. of the discipline, if it does have a moral stance, accords with theirs. And then there are others who find, well, I can do really good work here, right, mm-hmm. um, in this discipline. Uh, let me just make sure that, um, you know, whatever, I have adopted the language that is used in the discipline and yada, 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 right? Mm-hmm. So some of it is... Uh, I don't know. Some of it might be nature and some of it might be nurture and some of it might be the interaction. So I, I, yeah, I think it's definitely all of those things. Yeah, gotcha. No, no, you go, Mark. You go. Yeah. OK. Well, I think it's all of those things. We, we try to unpack that in the paper. We talk about the underlying moral intuitions that nudge people toward particular fields. And we mm-hmm. talk about the process of professional socialization and how you're going to interact with like minded people. It's going to reinforce. Mm-hmm. I think the danger comes in when uh, it spills into a kind of shaming mm-hmm. where certain ideas are, are and I, we have lots of examples in the paper that we've noticed in one of the sections where, you know, we, we present these vignettes, we talk about some research, mm-hmm. 
Mm -hmm. And we get many comments the effect of like, you know, shame on you researchers Mm -hmm. for creating controversy. This issue has been settled long ago. Um, This is, you know, arguing this is akin to saying, you know, that, you know, black people are underrepresented in STEM for biology reasons, things like this. He's very, very, it's very easy to tap a nerve, Mm -hmm. even though we made every effort to sort of present the claims in in as an innocuous a fashion. And we also presented them in each way. So we, we, we have questions to the effect that, you know, institutional racism, social structure, poverty, these are the reasons for the perpetuation of poverty, mm-hmm. that any cultural reason is going to be negligible. We ask that, but we also ask it the other way, which says maybe maybe cultural factors in the inner city, like a kind of street code, make a bad situation worse. Mm-hmm. But that spills into agency for vulnerable people and people with left liberal intuitions. We aren't comfortable with that. It's like, what are you saying? It's their fault. That's blaming the victim. Right. So, and then that's where all the shaming flows out of, I think. Well, I mean... Uh- no, I'm not going to say what I was going to say. <laughs> Are you sure? Uh, All right. I mean, basically, I mean, here, look, you know, the way I, I like one of the things when I first in my first year of graduate school, mm-hmm. right, I remember so much the kind of like beating into our heads, like critical distance, being able to be totally objective, oh, yeah. et cetera, et cetera. Right. And and I remember, I mean, me, myself, being someone who, I mean, although I was born in Canada, right, I've lived here my entire life, basically, mm-hmm. right? Um, and I grew up in a low-income, racially segregated part of Brooklyn, mm-hmm. right? Where all of this, quote-unquote, culture of poverty, right? You know, I mean, that's where you would totally see it, right? And one of the things that I found interesting was that almost nobody who was studying things like culture of poverty um, within these kinds of settings where people like me who were like, well, you know, I'm a native, mm-hmm. right? You know what I mean? Maybe I could help navigate, you know, some of this stuff, this stuff, how much of it is culture, how much of it is a culture, right? That is enacted by a very small portion of the people within here, within, uh, within that community, right? But they have maybe an outsized effect, et cetera, et cetera. Mm-hmm. And, you know, I'm not saying that culture doesn't matter. What I do think is that very often people who aren't natives to that culture, I think actually approach that culture and totally misapprehend what it is, mm. right? And so that's my biggest problem with this, with the whole culture of poverty thing is mm. uh, I think most of the people who study it actually don't really understand what they're studying. So I, I feel like we've teased the paper enough. And what I love about the sacred victims paper is that you kind of uh, you, you kind of do like Daniel Klein of uh, George Mason does with The Economist. You go and show where the prevailing views are in the discipline. And what really struck me is the difference between what you see communicated to you sort of through elite culture through the publications and what the street culture of sociology believes. So this is the difference between the the view of sociology that's transmitted to us either through our internal media or through the voices of prominent sociologists versus what you get when you try to get anonymous responses from the regular sociologist. And the two are very different, right? And uh, I was... Oh. I was hoping you could just go over the empirical findings of what uh, what what you found there. Before I do quickly, Joe, when you say how Mm -hmm. it's been transmitted, are you Mm -hmm. referring to sort of the way conservative media frames like sociologists, a whole bunch of leftist sort of thing and the kind of biases attendant to that? Or do you have something else in mind? There's that. There's also, I think, maybe uh, a sense we've had high profile people make very strong normative proclamations or, you know, there are high profile people who convey a very strong view of uh, what sociology's morality should be. And it might be that you see those voices and you think that that reflects mainstream views, but sociology appears to be much more ideologically diverse than I would have suspected looking at your survey results. I think, no, I think you're absolutely right. And there's a number of questions that sort of attest to that. Mm -hmm. Like we asked sociologists about, um, say, whether it's 
going back to Leslie's point about what she learned in grad school, like mm-hmm. is, is a dispassionate attitude in your research important, you know, to mm-hmm. accurately explain phenomena and you're going to see lots of division there. Should we separate advocacy and research, mm-hmm. right? Um, would political conservatives, like more of them benefit the discipline? Mm-hmm. I mean, the field's completely divided on that. And that might be surprising to people who have a stereotype mm-hmm. about where the field is. It's about 30% saying it would be a good thing, 30% bad thing. And uh, 40% undecided on that. So there's a whole cluster of questions like that that I think would be of interest that would defy that stereotype. I think in terms of our empirical findings that are most sort of important from the point of view of the theoretical perspective that we have, trying mm-hmm. to explain the data, is the political differences. And we, we can go into gender differences, we can go into disciplinary yeah. subfield differences. The political differences are the most pronounced. So if you take a specific question, what you'll find is that um, radicals, liberals, and moderates systematically differ on a particular question. And, mm-hmm. and part, part of the difficulty in conveying it succinctly is that we provide these vignettes, which I don't think we have time to read, mm-hmm. which provide a little bit of context to the reader in terms of what's going on in, in, in the research mm-hmm. prior to these. But just go, so just I'll just point to a few of these just for purpose of discussion. Yeah. Uh, the question of, you know, is it plausible that cultural factors play some role in, in perpetuating inner city poverty in the black community? Mm-hmm. And 56% of radical sociologists say yes. 77% of liberal and then 93 of moderate. Mm-hmm. Um, so what you'll see a question after question, you'll see a stairway like that um, where, uh, so let's see, I'm going to go, I'm gonna go to the other ones here. There's so, some uh, crazy views that I was surprised about. Like for example, a third of your respondents felt women and people oriented professions is partly biological. Right. Uh, I would not have expected that from sociologists for a third to, See a biological well, and, 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 basis. Well, let me just chime in with the politics of it. Sixteen yeah. percent of radicals think that. Thirty-five mm-hmm. percent of liberal sociologists, and then thirty-nine percent of moderate. So the field as a whole, it, I don't. We try not to take positions so much on these things. Mm-hmm. Uh, we do sometimes, but that's not my main goal. My main goal is to understand ideology, not to engage in ideology critique. I don't want to be on a team shaming my fellow sociologists for their biases. It's not very helpful. I want to understand what undergirds why we're biased in the first place. And uh, that said, though, on this particular issue, and this speaks a little to the blank slate, so maybe it's a segue that might be useful. Mm -hmm. On this particular issue, it just strikes me as plausible. I still feel a little defensiveness, but Mm -hmm. it just strikes me as pretty plausible from an evolutionary point of view that men and women would have different emotive tendencies that certainly get... Uh, uh, shaped and influenced by socialization. But the notion of putting a kind of like ideological fiat and saying, well, we are biologically the, you know, different in terms of our genitalia, but we have no psychological differences. We sort of have to establish that at the outset. I don't find that convincing anymore. I used to when I was in graduate school, but I, I moved con- from total constructionism toward uh, a view that's informed by evolutionary biology more and more. Jeez, it's hard for me to get there on that one. I mean, listen, I, I will willingly concede that I probably share a lot of the the, uh, you know, the biases of my colleagues, but geez, some of that stuff is, it would be hard for me to agree. And I see myself right in line. Well, let me uh, well I, I mean, and I think part of it is also that there is a strand of evolutionary biology right, mm-hmm. that is ridiculous, mm-hmm. right? Um, you know, like I've mentioned him before, but people like, you know, like Rushton, right? And his whole, his whole Evo bio theories about, about race, right? Mm-hmm. And how, you know, it's like different races have evolved in different ways, such that some have larger genitalia. And because they have larger oh, genitalia, yeah. their brains are smaller, right? Um, you know, that's just incredible. I mean, I'm sorry, that's ridiculous, right? Um, and I think that strand of evolutionary biology, I think, uh, let's us understand that, you know, it's not just the social sciences in which, you know, sort of politics might creep in in order to shape and frame what it is we constitute as proof, right? And mm-hmm. what we think what we think of as evidence. But I mean, for definitely for sure. I mean, in, you know, during like, you know, the 19th century, like in through the middle of the 20th century, we saw ways in which politics actually helped inform medical research, biomedical research, mm-hmm. and biological research. So um, none of none of us is pure, like in, mm-hmm. and, and, and no discipline, to my knowledge, has been totally free of, um, of the imperatives of our society, right? Um, and, you know, and the norms of our society. Mm-hmm. My take, I, I barely, literally barely familiar with Rushton. And my impression is, 
I could be wrong, but that he's widely rejected by the vast majority of evolutionary biologists. So, um, na- I mean, so you know, now he is. Now okay. he is. But I mean, but Rushton was public, like, like had been published. I mean, he's dead now, but he had been published in some of the leading evolutionary biology journals, right? So if that's an indicator of acceptance, right? When was um, he? When was, uh, when was Rushton active? I, I don't know any of this field. Well, I think, I mean, Rushton just died a few years, not that, not that long ago. It's like right? an 80s another, thing or? A, a, another Canadian. Um, Rushton was publishing like, like, through, like at least through the late 90s, mm-hmm. right? Um, and even into the, I think the early aughts maybe. But I don't know if that was original research because he was censured by his university mm-hmm. um, for uh, violating IRB rules. So well, that's a common. No, go, go, you go, Mark. No, I was going to say, it's, it's not uncommon for uh, discussion of potential differences, say, between men and women that have an evolved aspect to be to sort of end up inviting this kind of historization mm-hmm. of everything, you know, from social Darwinism to eugenics and everything else. And I don't know, my, my take on things is that it ends up functioning as a kind of shaming. Uh, of course, we reject all of the history of eugenics. And, uh, but at the end of the day, we don't, I would say, we don't bend the stick so far to police certain ideas from even being discussable, especially ones that seem pretty plausible. And Joe, you had mentioned, you, I don't, you can I plead guilty to be part of the consensus in the field, but mm-hmm. I don't know, I hear people whose politics I don't share, but who scientifically seem plausible, who make the argument, look at countries in Scandinavia, where there's been decades of efforts to integrate STEM fields, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. and climates where there's not a lot of pressure that the notion that there could be a kind of gravitational pull based on women tending to want to work with people more mm-hmm. than men on average, again, these are averages, and men right. uh, tending to want to work with things could be part of the explanatory cocktail. It's not an advocacy of it. Mm-hmm. My politics are firmly in the camp of, of feminism. I identify as a feminism pretty deeply. Mm-hmm. But I think the conflation of trying to describe scientific and empirical processes with your normative stance mm-hmm. is a problem that counter again and again, and it speaks again to the sort of explanatory framework we provide in the papers, which is that we're emotional communities, we're moral communities, we're not just scientific communities. Yeah, that that was the reaction that I had to the paper. And, you know, it's like I can see my own biases and see them as biases. And that's sort of, it was an interesting paper in that way, like to get my head around it. Leslie, did you want to say something? Did I cut you off? No, no, no. I mean, I was basically just going to say, you know, I mean, I, I think um, I think one of the places in which we actually uh, see uh, see this advancing is in the whole field of sociogenomics. Right. Um, this idea. And I actually and I actually think it's smart. Like, I actually think sociologists should actually be like in the game of of being able to sort of help help interrogate like what's going on with with our genome and how much of you know what's going on it, you know given certain outcomes you know how much of it what percentage of it is nature right you know meaning like your genetic code what percentage it, uh, is is structure or your environment right and how can we help um, people who are in like the field of genomics to create better uh, measures of those things that constitute the environment, right? In order to get a better understanding of what's going on. I'm all for it. Um, the one thing that I worry about is I is at least some of the work that I've been seeing is, you know, this whole sociogenomics, it's like, it's all genetics, like, and the socio part is very light. Mm-hmm. And, um, and, you know, I mean, hey, biologists, Of course, because they're biologists, they believe that, you know, what drives stuff is biological. Sociologists, because they're sociologists, they believe that what drives stuff is like the social, right? And I would hate, I would hate to actually see sociology, um, you know, sort of like giving into like kind of like that status game of being like, oh, let's be more like biologists. Mm. And I would add to that that there's I agree with the dangers, Leslie, and, and there's powerful political economic forces, there's right wing forces that'll use all of these ideas for for nefarious political ends, but also just also empirically wrong reductionist mm-hmm. arguments. So I agree we have to be in the game, but I don't think we can run away from it out of fear. Um, I don't think that the findings, the genetic stuff I'm familiar with, uh, suggests no role for the social. I, I think one of the 
you know, sort of emerging consensus as I read it is that the vast majority of traits have at least, you know, have around a half heritability factor to them. I and mean, some of them are higher, like your physical height or something like that is much higher than half. But um, so, yeah, there's a, a large role for our genes, but there's also an equally large role and in some cases, stronger role for the for society and, and sociologists should be in the game and explaining that. I have to say on, on the power of biology, nothing so squarely pressed the power of biology into my face as having multiple children because like, <laughs> You, it's the arrays have been more or less the same conditions, and they turn out so differently. And you notice that, uh, yeah, I don't know. It's like they, it's like you, you, you just you're you're surprised at how each one comes out so differently. I suppose uh, Nate Nurture can still be at work, birth order or who knows what, but it, mm-hmm. uh, the the role of biology is undeniable. I did want to talk about two really interesting findings that you had. One was uh, your findings on the uh, balance of objectivity and advocacy in the discipline uh, because they were really evenly split. So, for example, about 35 percent of sociologists you survey said that sociology is undermined by excessive activism and 51 percent disagreed. Advocacy and research should be separate for objectivity. 44% 44% agree, 43% disagree. Dispassionate attitude and research is important for accuracy. 47% agree, 39% disagree. So, I, uh, you know, this objectivity argument that's been going on all semester long, I guess it really reflects a big cleavage in, in the belief system of our discipline, doesn't it? Like, Yeah, I have, a, I have a lot to say on that, but I don't want to go in too long. So. <laughs> <laughs> that's okay. Cut me off at any time. All right. Well, do you want to say anything yeah. briefly or? Oh, do I want? Yeah, sure. Yeah. Um, I agree with what you just said. Mm-hmm. And uh, I heard the earlier podcast you guys had done on this issue where you visited it in mm-hmm. terms of the uh, president, uh, I guess, elective ASA. Uh, president um, now, yeah. Or president now. Okay. Yeah. The uh, the way I see it is is uh, I'm committed to the camp, if you want to call it that, of of science approximating the truth. I'm not somebody who thinks we're getting the capital T truth when it comes to social science. I think few of us think that. And I think that it's a real problem to abdicate a commitment to that. I think it's empirically wrong on one level, but it's also politically disastrous. So it's empirically wrong just because we have methods and tools. Like we can't, we, we have data that gets constrained by having to present it to other sociologists and our, our journals will debate the methods and so on. So it's simply not true that we, we don't better approximate the truth. But then I think you made this point, or uh, maybe Gabriel did on the prior podcast, just uh, it's politically disastrous just because it feeds right into agendas that say, you know, who, who says this plan would, you know, get rid of pre-existing conditions? Or, you know, it's up to the interpreter whether climate change is happening. Mm-hmm. Um, so it's very dangerous to begin to speak of the, the professional legitimacy of what we do as sociologists is just a jockeying for power mm-hmm. or to reduce our just a, a, a jockeying over discourse and power. Uh, I don't think it's true and it's politically problematic. That said, I'm sorry, I'm speaking so fast no. here. That said, if you asked like 19 out of 20, you know, the people who agree with President Romero on challenging objectivity, if you mm-hmm. asked them about climate change, I think they'd all be lined up and say, oh, it's a problem. We got to deal with it. Mm-hmm. So I say this not to call them out in their contradiction, but there is a contradiction. You, know, you, you really can't have your relativism in your climate change too, mm-hmm. right? So what's going on there? And I think what's going on is that objectivity isn't what's being argued about. It's about a political positionality and a moral positionality. I think the people that are talking about objectivity are, are, and, and complaining about or critiquing it are really complaining about a kind of nonchalance among more moderate sociologists who don't share the same kind of passionate commitment to questions of vulnerable groups, Right. They're not their, their their language game isn't the same when it comes to speaking to those deep emotional resonances. And that's really what they're opposed to. So oh. they, they want to rattle the chain and say, we got to take these moral issues more seriously, people. And uh, so that's my take on the objectivity debate. Well, my take. Uh, so this is what I think. Right. I think in the camp of people. Right. Who's who feel as though what. Mary Romero's, her message is resonating with them. I think her message is resonating for multiple issues, right? I think some people in the in the camp are relativists, right? I think some people in the camp, right, are saying, you know, this is about advocacy. But I also think a significant portion of people in the camp are saying, look, this is a moment for sociology to step back 
right? And think about, you know, all of the assumptions that undergird a lot of our work, right, that we take for granted that perhaps we should be revisiting. Because unless we do that, then the work that we do, right, without actually shedding light on those assumptions and critiquing them, that work will never be objective, right? And so I think that that's, that there is a significant camp of people for whom that's what this message is about. It's not about relativism, right? It's not about there is no such thing as facts, mm -hmm. right? It's about saying sociology, if we really want to actually approach objectivity, we need to clean house and we need to start thinking about um, some of the assumptions that we make in our discipline that maybe really aren't objective at all. So that's, those are two different views. Like, uh, Leslie, I would say your view will be strengthened if the ASA program has a lot of programming on methodology mm -hmm. and has like philosophers of science. If it has people who are upset about the conclusions that people reach uh, because it's suppressing emancipatory research, then I think that would bear out Mark's explanation right like is it yeah, going to be no technique or is it going to be uh you're not fighting the agenda and you know what which whoever is right i guess it will it will shine through when we see the construction of the the plenary sessions and mm -hmm. uh and and who who's on the speaker's slate but uh, uh, my guess is my guess is with mark uh on this one just because i i just haven't seen a lot of I haven't seen a, a, a like a, 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 a lot of buzz around social science people, uh, you know, and, uh, you know, bringing in some heavy hitter philosophers of science to come look at those. Things. Well, I mean, I well, I can tell you, right, as a medical sociologist, mm -hmm. right, and like someone who's like in that camp of, so, you know, sociology of knowledge, mm -hmm. right, sociology of science, right, like that like w that last thing that I said, mm -hmm. right? That's what resonates with me, right? With what uh, Romero, what, what her statement said. That's, and so that's exactly the way that I'm taking it. Mm -hmm. And I actually think that there are quite a few people like me, right? Who like, this is the way that we interpret um, Mary Romero's statement, right? Um, and I'm not saying that's the only way to interpret it, mm -hmm. but I'm saying that for me, right, that's the value of that statement mm. to me. Okay. That's, and wait, okay, and then one last one, because I know we got to wrap it up, but this one kind of blew mm -hmm. my mind, and this is one where I'm going to uh, adhere. I'm going to stick with my, my morality and not. Uh, <laughs> SC19, discussion of Muslim threat to values is Islamophobic. I think that's a completely Islamophobic thing uh, and 45 percent of uh our colleagues disagree they feel like discussing muslim threat is to values is not islamophobic uh huh. yeah i find that crazy islamophobic as if like one construing a, a threat from an entire religion and imputing like one set of values on a religion and then seeing it as a threat to our native values. I totally see that as Islamophobic. And I'm shocked that just under half of our colleagues don't, don't see that as, as Islamophobic. Uh, Mark, what was, what, what sort of reactions did you hear from this? Am I just, just refusing to let go of my, you know, my moral values or. Well, I think it's important to situate it. Cause again, we provide those vignettes. We provide an immigration vignette on this. Mm -hmm. So it's in the context of flows of, of uh, Muslims into Europe. Okay. So in that sort of broader context, because again, it depends on what we mean by Muslim threat to values. Mm -hmm. I mean, those are kind of charged words. Yeah. Um, but you know, to the extent that it's empirically measurable that people who would migrate to Europe might carry with them certain gendered attitudes, attitudes toward homosexuality, attitudes toward free speech regarding religion that choke against, you know, Western liberal sensibilities, right. right? Can you discuss that? Can we even have a study about that? Can we try to measure it without it inherently being Islamophobic? That was what we were at least going for in okay. the survey. And I think that situation, I mean, that might soften a little bit. Your yeah, view. that I don't does know. soften it, it. That does soften it. Yeah, because even, even radical sociologists, only 41% agree that discussion itself of it hmm. is Islamophobic. And then it plummets. I mean, only 5% of moderates 
So very, very few moderate uh, sociologists. Um, and super, super fast, though, just because I love the way Leslie had framed her interpretation of Romero. Uh-huh. And I, I can sort of like proudly say, like, that's exactly what I think I'm doing. Mm-hmm. I'm trying to do exactly what that's the part of Romero's statement. If interpreted that way, it resonates with me, too. Like mm-hmm. the extent we become more self-aware of, our, of ourselves as a moral community to the extent we lessen the likelihood of shaming each other. Because by the way, I think all of us are attracted to it. We like feeling good about ourselves. So we like to shame. We should shame the racist, first of all, if we encounter one in our daily lives, right? Mm-hmm. But you know, in, in academic life, we, I think we need to resist this temptation, try to step back and be able to listen to what people say without being so trigger ready mm-hmm. to gain the rewards of, of kind of virtue signaling within our moral communities. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And, and also, too, I, I think it goes the other way, too. Right. I mean, you know, we you know, we you know about the you know, reward center of the brain. Mm-hmm. Right. You know what I mean? And so how much is, you know, sort of like normative or like moralistic thinking within our field mm-hmm. also driving people to actually create the kind of knowledge that they think, well, then you know, have people calling them virtuous as well as good scholars, right? Yes. For more, visit us on the web, theannexpodcast.com.